All right, before I get into today's class, um, well, let me start with this. Our outline, we are on week five, so we're halfway through as of the start of today. Today's class is councils, monks, popes, and Augustine. Um, the, before I get into that, I'm going to deal with one issue from last time. I apologize, I didn't quite catch you. I was trying to remember the name Edward Gibbon. Uh, what is your impression of him? Because he said a couple of sort of nasty things in there. He is a historian. Gibbon wrote The, Rise, uh, the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Yes. And so he is, um, was an expert, particularly on the Roman era. And uh, that they quote him on that, but he, you know, he had no faith orientation, as far as I'm aware. But he was speak, speaking purely from a historical point of view, okay, uh, from a non-Christian historical point of view. Again, I believe I don't know that much about Gibbon personally, so but I don't from his writings. I don't. I assume that he was not a person of faith. Okay? You mentioned an umlaut or something, but maybe that can I can get more information. Than I have. Sure, well, what that means in an argument in the early church. Oh, um, I will talk today about homoousios and homoiousios. That um, the th that was Gibbon's version. He said umla. It's not really. It's like Greek letter I iota, and that was the cause of much of the you know decades, even more than a century of argument over the Arian controversy, and we'll talk about that. The, the smallest of Greek letters was the difference between the two words that they differed on. Okay? Uh, before I get into that, I just remember several people in this class have talked about, well, what about what else was happening in the world? You know, what about China? What about Mesoamerica, which is us here? Um, my lovely wife bought this for me at a map shop in Seattle we were just in. This is a charted graph of wow. all of world history, from, <laughs> at least from 3000 BC to 2000 AD. And uh, what it does, here on the left-hand side, they have the major uh, geographical areas, Asia, North Africa, the Eastern Mediterranean, Europe, Africa, and America. And in these big masses of color, as you, you can come up and look at it at the break if you want or afterwards, um, are the various empires or, or people groups that were dominant, etc. And then across the bottom, they have um, uh, significant people and events. They, they don't really chart the... Um, Christianity in here because it wasn't a political entity, but you can see it in uh, late Roman Empire, Byzantine Empire, etc. Um, so if you like to come up and look at the break, you're welcome to do that. It's kind of a fun chart. Uh, may thoroughly confuse you, but at least <laughs> it'll give you a chance. You can identify the years we're talking about in terms of history, and then what was happening in China, what was happening in Mesoamerica, etc. So you get a perspective on that. Okay? Well, yes. Well, just to comment, I noticed it had Elvis Presley. Yeah, well. <laughs> All of the great saints are included. <laughs> How do they determine AC, AD? It's based upon the life of Jesus. Is that exactly? Right? But when did it start with his birth? His well, um, it, it actually was intended to be with his birth, but the people that originally set this up made a mistake, and they didn't discover it for quite a long time later. That's what I was wondering. That we believe now that it's more accurate to say Jesus was probably born sometime around 4 to 6 BC, you know, before Christ. Um, and so we believe that, that was the intention, is to have the new era, uh, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, start with the birth of Jesus. But we now believe they probably got it wrong, based upon subsequent research in terms of what Scripture says was going on when uh, the second census when Quirinius was governor, you know, all that kind of stuff. Then we believe that they missed it by between four and six years, uh, but that was the intention: is that they would start the new era with the birth of Jesus. How they established that. Yeah. And again, we've talked about this before, but in case somebody missed it, if you're doing readings, you will now see um, C.E. and B.C.E. instead of A.D. and B.C. The reason is because Jesus' birth is the turning point. Those people who don't want to suggest a religious overtone toward all of history, you know, liberal scholars, uh, non-Christian scholars, they've decided they're going to start calling it, instead of Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, based upon Jesus, the, where we are now is called the Common Era, or CE. And then before that is called BCE, or before the Common Era, okay? So if you see BCE, it's the same as BC. If you see CE, common era, that's the same as what we call AD, Anno Domini, Year of Our Lord. Okay? Yes. 
you had mentioned that the, the absolute fall of the Roman Empire was in 1492. Right. What what was that like? Um, because when you when you look at history, you know they had there were many attacks on Rome and Rome was burned and all this. Well, what? Uh, constituted the absolute end, the absolute fall. Right, well, um, the fall of Constantinople. Because, and I'm going to get into that a little bit today. Okay. When people say the fall of the Roman Empire and they list it in the 400s, that's yes. not accurate. Rome fell in the 400s, and the Western Roman Empire fell. But at that, by that time, starting with Constantine, when Constantine became the the Roman Emperor, he was the Emperor over all of the Roman Empire, he moved his capital to what had been called uh, Byzantium, Constantinople he renamed it, which is the city of Constantine. That became the Eastern, the, the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. You'll remember under Diocletian, we talked about this, Diocletian was the Emperor that split the Empire in two in order to make it easier to manage. Well from that point on, there were eastern capitals and western capital. Now Constantine comes along and defeats all of his opponents and he's the emperor over the entire thing. He makes his primary capital in Constantinople, the city of Constantine. Rome started declining as Constantinople was growing. In the 400s, Rome was actually sacked more than once. You know, first by Attila the Hun, well first the Visigoths and then the uh, Attila the Hun was there, and then the, the Vandals showed up. Basically, everybody took turns. They were lining up, taking numbers to sack Rome. Well, that was in the decline. When Rome fell, the Western Roman Empire, meaning Europe, basically, was taken over by predominantly Germanic barbarian tribes. And that's when they taught, that's the Dark Ages. But in our culture, we completely miss the fact that the Eastern Empire, the eastern half of the Roman Empire, <coughs> saw themselves as the Roman Empire, and, and the guy in charge was called the Emperor of Rome. You know, That still existed for a thousand more years in Constantinople, Byzantium. That's the Byzantine, we talk about the Byzantine Empire, and we don't know enough about it to even realize that that was the continuation of the Roman Empire. And so Rome fell in the 400s, and the western half of the Roman Empire went into the Dark Ages. But the eastern half, which was actually the wealthier half, the more cultured half, you know, um, based in, in Constantinople, that continued to flourish for a thousand more years. What year? 1492. 1492. It's easy to remember. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, Constantinople finally fell uh, the year that, that uh, Columbus discovered America. Okay, Carol, you had something? Oh, it's just a dumb question. Uh, you were talking about um, BC and AD. Is there a year zero? A year zero. Um, or does it go from 1 BC to 1 AD? Or whatever. <laughs> I think they do. I think they have, I think they say 0 AD as okay. being the, you know, supposedly the year of the birth, but it's not accurate. Uh, I, I was going to ask about the, 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 the religion in Constantinople. <coughs> that became the Who's Christian. Orthodox? Yeah, well, that's where, um, and again, we're going to talk about this Great Schism next week. Great Schism, which is, which is when Western Christianity, which was Latin, based in Rome, we're going to talk about the, the patriarchies and the seas and stuff today, how the major cities have developed as the centers of Christianity. But Western Christianity spoke Latin, used the Roman rule, they used the Apostles' Creed, which was developed in Latin. In the East, they spoke Greek, and eventually the West turned into the Roman Catholic Church, centered in Rome. The East turned into the Orthodox churches, and there's several kinds. There's Eastern Orthodox, um, and, you know, and, and various other Oriental Orthodox and others. So there are a lot of but the base, different ones. And, but the basis is in Constantinople. The basis for the largest body of the Orthodox Church is in Constantinople. And the patriarch of Constantinople is like the Pope of uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church. <coughs> Coptic is one part. It's you like part of the Coptic Orthodox Church is the Egyptian version oh. of Orthodoxy. There's also an Oriental Orthodox Church, which is based in uh, India and other locations. Whereas the Eastern Orthodox incorporates the largest bodies, which are Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, you know, etc. So you've got different kinds of Orthodox, just like you've got different kinds of Protestant, right? But still call themselves Protestant, all right? Any other questions? 
Oh, the things we know. Did you know? All right. Before we get into the discussion of today, which is councils, monks, popes, and Augustine, I want to get into something I didn't have time for last week. But next week we will talk about schisms. That is, schism is a split. The great, the great schism was the split between Western Latin Church, which became Roman Catholicism, and the Eastern Church, which became Orthodoxy. All right, and we'll talk about what that was and why it was. We'll also talk about the barbarians. That is, when the Western Church fell to the barbarian hordes, in very short order, they started becoming Christian, and that had a huge effect on the history of the church. In fact, I think I mentioned that the Reconquista, which was the effort by the Christian Western Europeans to drive the Muslims out of Spain and Portugal, the, the first general that really had success against the Moors, against the Muslims, was a Visigoth Christian. You know, he was a member of the tribe that originally had been pagan barbarian that had sacked Rome, and yet the Visigoths had been Christianized by them. And we'll look at Gregory the Great, one of the great leaders of the church. Then uh, week seven, Charlemagne, cathedrals, crusades, and scholastics. And week eight, we will deal with poverty, uh, the Inquisition, the Babylonian captivity. That's not the Jewish Babylonian captivity. That is the Babylonian captivity of the Catholic Church in Avignon in France. So the Catholic Babylonian captivity was in France. France. Okay, so you we'll, that from me. we'll talk about the brands. <laughs> yes. um, this week is on Tuesday, right? Next week, the class, this class will meet on Tuesday next week because I have to be out of town again. I apologize. So we will meet Tuesday at 1 o'clock next week. If you can't make it Tuesday at 1 o'clock, then since the class will be held at Tuesday at 1 o'clock, then by Friday when you would ordinarily be here, you can sit down at your computer and watch the video. So either way, you'll get it done next week, okay? And we will have the final exam in the second hour in week 8, and I will in the next couple of weeks be giving you the paper that says, here's all the things you need to know from church history from the Apostles to 1500, the pre-Reformation, okay? Now, I want to deal with oh, that's a little high. Uh, the cult of the martyrs. I left this off from last week, I didn't get to it. How did we end up with this idea of holding up martyrs as being special? How did we get the intercession of the saints, for instance, which the Catholic Church believes in? The idea that the, 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 the holy people who have died before us pray for us, and that you can pray to them. All of this is related to the persecutions that we talked about last week. First, <coughs> under the persecutions of Decius and Valerius, two very aggressive persecutions. Decius's persecution was one of the first that was empire-wide. It wasn't just isolated to Rome or, or loca particular locales. A great many Christians lapsed under the persecution of Decius and Valerian, which means they renounced the faith. Decius, you will remember, was the one that required that they, they uh, sacrifice to pagan idols, and in, when they did so, they got what's called a libelus, which is a certificate that says, Congratulations, you sacrificed to the pagan gods, you know, and you burnt incense to the emperor. Well, there were a lot of people who, who, it had been over a generation since the last persecution. The Christians, Decius, surprised them with the new persecution, and a lot of them simply weren't prepared for it. They hadn't braced themselves for it, and a lot of them fell. They gave in to this, some of them very quickly. So, with a lot of people lapsing and renouncing their faith under these persecutions, the ones who died as martyrs under all persecutions, as well as those who held out under torture and still didn't renounce the faith, were very highly honored. So all of those who were called the confessors, who did not renounce the faith under Decius of Valerian, were held up as spiritual examples to everybody else that's alive. And at the same time, they looked back at all of those martyrs, the ones who had died rather than renounced their faith, and they, they had more and more of a sense of honoring these people who had given everything for their faith. Now, the cult of the martyrs, and what that means when we talk about cult of the martyrs, it means worship activities that were associated with martyrs and or the remains of the martyrs. This started out really by, as a way of showing respect and regard for those who had given their lives, they would go to their tombs, like the Roman catacombs, for instance. Um, and one of the reasons that they did this, not only because they wanted to show reverence or appreciation or you know, whatever to the people who suffered martyrdom, during the Roman persecutions, they could not 
uh, be a church. It's not like you could register as a church. But they could register as a funerary society. Back in those days, they had what's called a funerary society, which means a bunch of people would get together, pool their money in order to guarantee that they and their relatives would all get a decent burial when they died. That's the reason they met in the catacombs, more so than because of persecution in Roman times. The catacombs, they would go there and have worship services, and it was actually legitimate for them to be there because they were all registered members of the funerary society. Okay? So they would meet in these catacombs, and in the process, they would honor those who had gone before, who were buried there, who had been martyrs to the faith, who had held out against opposition. As they started doing that, they started being more and more influenced by Greek hero cults and Greco-Roman funerary practices. The, the Greek hero cults were the ideas that people who had lived and died and by doing something grand and great, sort of a quest kind of thing, that they became heroes and that you could almost worship them. Not quite, but almost worship them because they had been such heroes. Well, the Christians meeting in these tombs, meeting, meeting in order to honor these martyrs, began to experience some influence in that way, and they started thinking of these martyrs as more and more and more and more important over a period of time. Now, um, you even have some of the great leaders of the church, like Cyprian, who was one of the great apologist leaders. I mean, he, he wasn't part of the original apologist, but he was uh, a strong advocate for the faith and against heresy, for instance, against some of the, some of the Donatist schisms and some things like that. Cyprian, no less, was one of the ones who began to refer to the Eucharist that was offered in the tombs as being offered um, as an offering in memory of the martyrs. So they began to incorporate worship elements from the regular, uh, regular Christian worship began to be associated with these martyrs. You, you see how this sort of kind of a little at a time it built up this idea of the martyrs being something more than just you know really good people who held out and died for it. Um, then Christians started celebrating the date of death of those martyrs, calling it their birthday, which meant the day in which those martyrs were born into eternal life. This is where you get saints' days. You know, like almost, almost any day of the year is the, a day dedicated to some saint. In almost every case, unless it was added much later, that would be the day they were martyred, if they were a martyr. And most of the early saints were all martyrs. That's what gave them the qualification to be held up in such high regard. Uh, and initially, a saint meant what we think of it as meaning, is just a really holy person. But over a period of time, again, this started to accrue more meaning uh, as we went along. Now, at first, the prayers and the memorial services were simply held in the tombs. There was really no more to it than that. Then the idea came, somebody began to feel as though, well, you know what? The prayers that we are holding in those tombs, as we are honoring the martyrs, seem to be coming, they seem to be more effective. Those prayers seem to be answered more often in the way we want them to. And this led to the idea that praying in the presence of the bones of a martyr seemed to be more spiritual, because the prayers seemed to be answered more regularly. I'm not saying it really was, but that was the perception. That led to the idea that having the bones of the martyrs around was a benefit to worship. And as a result, they ultimately started taking these bones and putting them in new churches when they built churches, or even in old churches, to put the bones of the martyr uh, in the altar or underneath the altar so that they were always in the presence of the remains of those martyrs, even when they weren't in the tombs. If you go to Siena, St. Catherine of Siena, there's a glass box with her head in it, right there on the altar. Okay? And part of her was taken to Rome to put in the Vatican. You know, so they divvied her up. Um, and this, this, they had her finger, too. They had her finger, yeah. They had, they had her skull and her finger in Siena, which is where she came from. Now, um, it ended up creating a huge demand for bones of the martyrs. And probably, if you took all of the bones of Catherine of Siena or of John the Baptist and put them all together in one place, you'd have a small army. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, well, here's a femur from John the Baptist. Well, I thought I saw a femur of John the Baptist. And he went, no, 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 this is the one. Okay. Um, 
It's like in Mark Twain's writings, he said that when in um, Innocence Abroad, he goes to, he, he said, I don't trust museums anymore because he said, I was in a museum in Europe and they had two skulls of Christopher Columbus. One of Christopher Columbus as a child and one of Christopher Columbus as a child. So, and that's almost what it must have felt like back in those days, okay? Because they helped, they, they, they would convince themselves that, that the bones of the martyrs accented worship. And I'm not, I'm not jumping on, this is, I'm speaking of this, and it seems kind of strange to us, as a historically neutral thing. This is how it developed. I'm not trying to be critical. Because you know what? This isn't against the Catholic Church, because when this was happening, they was us. You know, that, that, there was no difference. There was one church at that point. Um, then there came the idea that these departed martyrs and saints, that is, those who were in the presence of God, that they not only, not only were the prayers of the living Christians more effective when their bones, the bones of the martyrs were present, but even that somebody developed the doctrine, and I don't even know who it was, that these saints who they believed were still alive, right? You know, we don't really die, we're still alive. They were in the presence of God, they had the freedom and power to speak directly to God, so if they're still alive and they've demonstrated the prayers are more effective in the presence of the remains, then we can talk to them in prayer, and then they can speak directly to God for us. That's where the intercession of saints came from. It really did start out with just the fact of saying, um, you know, these people gave everything for the faith, and we need to respect them. We need to really honor them for having done that. And over a period of time, step by step, it came to the point of thinking, the saints are in the presence of God, and we can pray to the saints, and they'll present our petitions to God. Even though Scripture says there is one mediator between God and man, who is Christ the Lord. Okay, so this is how the cult of the martyrs and the cult of the saints came to be. Um, to give you some understanding, any questions about that, <coughs> John? Um, just a footnote. Um, I read somewhere, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I read somewhere where even this began. You know this this great surge of martyrdom. It was valid. It was it was, it was valid. But the early church fathers saw a trend that became disturbing, and that was people then, because these martyrs were being honored, they wanted to die. Yeah. Not so much to glorify Christ, but that they would be honored. And so there are, uh, if I remember reading correctly, there were times when these fathers reprimanded people and sent yeah. out edicts saying, you know, do not be a martyr unless this and this and this. Unless it's a call of God, because they believe martyrdom was the response to a call. That's why they didn't, you know, if somebody just ran away, I mean, if they didn't renounce the faith, but they just ran away, they were, they were not held in um, very negatively, because the idea was that if they weren't called to martyrdom, then they should have run away, because that's a unique call of God. Um, yeah, it's either in your book or it's in Gonzalez that they talk about that, that it's in our book, that, yeah, that, uh, in fact, they announced that if you volunteer for martyrdom, then we're not going to honor you as a martyr when you're dead. So you're not going to get anything out of it, so shape up. In the same way that after Origen had himself castrated to become a eunuch, you know, for the Lord, uh, by misreading of that text, there were other people who were volunteering to be castrated, and the church had to, had to send out edicts and saying, if you do this, you're not going to be accepted into the priesthood, um, or as a, as a preacher or a bishop, and if you are a, uh, an elder, a presbyter, or a bishop, and you do this to yourself, we'll, we'll throw you out. So don't do this. Okay. Same thing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later about monks and the monastic movement. Um, St. Anthony, who's one of the two real founders of the, the anchorite, that is the solitary, the hermetic, you know, the hermit uh, monks, um, he, once he went to the desert in his early 20s, he only left the desert twice to go into Alexandria, because he was in the desert in Egypt, and once was in order to um, to straighten out, they had, they had said that he had supported Arian in this great controversy, and he, he walked into uh, in Alexandria to tell the bishop, no I don't, they're lying, you know, I'm not on his side on this thing, and the other time he went in was to offer himself for martyrdom. Uh, he and a bunch of the other monks went in and said, please kill us, you know, because they thought that was how they could uh, follow the Lord. And then the Romans said, no, go back, you know, and so they went back to the desert. Those are the only two reasons they came in, and once is because he was volunteering to become a martyr. Um, so, we'll talk about that. Any other questions?
you begin to see that some of the doctrines that we look at and go, how in the world did they get there? Some of it had to do with misinterpretations of things that, but a lot of it has to do with sort of historic accrual, I would call it, where, you know, a tiny step at a time, and before you know it, there's a widespread belief in something that it's very difficult for us to understand looking at it here in the 21st century. But we do need to understand that frequently in history, that's the way things work. You know, baby steps take you to some place where you go, how in the world did they get there? Right? Okay. They have a lot of saints days here in Mexico, and that's completely separate. That's the Catholic. Well, that's what I'm talking about. The, the, the Protestants, we don't have saint days. That's what yeah. We may have certain days that we recognize, you know, like the birthday of Martin Luther or whatever, but it's very different. Same thing, the, the Mexican saint days are all the Catholic saint days. You know, plus a few that are unique to probably to the Mexican culture. And that is what you're talking about. And that is what I'm talking about. That's exactly what we're talking about. Okay. Kenneth? A really good book to read is uh, the, called The Devil's Advocate. Mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's a novel, but it's, it goes into explaining how the Catholics go about, in this particular sense, in deciding whether this person is a saint. It's, yeah. a, it's a fantastic mm -hmm. novel written okay. in the 50s. Yeah, there's also a really horrible movie with uh... But it's not the same one. Okay, good. <laughs> Alright, um, I now want to talk about the seven ecumenical councils. Let me see if I can fix that a little bit. So you can please read it. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, the seven ecumenical councils, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail to them today, but I want to identify them to you. I'm primarily going to talk about just the first one, and then I'll give you just a couple of high points of the others. Um, I also want to say, by, by way of apology, it seems like I'm apologizing a lot lately, um, I don't have as fully a developed PowerPoint presentation today as I wanted, simply because I ran out of time trying to get everything done. Uh, I intend over the next few days to try to fill this out a little bit, so go on definitely by next week, go online, look at it, because there should be more data than you're going to see today. Okay, uh, I want to talk first about the First Council of Nicaea and how we came to that. Um, the Christian Church, as we have talked about several times already, had a long history of dealing with theological controversies, disagreements over theological point. In Paul's day, and if you're in our Bible study, we're talking about Galatians. In Paul's day, it was the persecution of the Gentiles by the, well, the persecution of Jewish Christians, but then also the effort by the Jewish Christians to force the Gentiles to be circumcised. Um, when we get into Cyprian, who I mentioned a minute ago, he dealt with um, the, the Gnostic controversy and then uh, also how to restore the lapsed when somebody fell during one of the persecutions. Um, we had all kinds of different controversies, but prior to the early 300s, prior to the Emperor Constantine, the first emperor who would allow Christianity to be legal, um, who was not a Christian, by the way, until his deathbed. He was only baptized on his deathbed. But Constantine allowed Christianity to be legal. Prior to Constantine, all of the disagreements the church had, all the theological controversies or heresies or whatever were dealt internally and in a context of a culture in which they technically were illegal. And so they would have long conversations and discussions and finally come to some consensus. Well, Constantine comes along, and whereas prior to Constantine, the civil authorities never were even probably aware, much less had any desire to do anything about controversies within the Christian church, Constantine comes along and everything changes. All of a sudden, there was another sheriff in town. There was someone else on the scene, that is the emperor, who was advocating, even though he wasn't himself a Christian, was advocating for the Christian church because he believed that Christianity was the right way to grow and develop and strengthen the Roman Empire. His predecessors, Decius, Valerian, and others, they thought the way to strengthen the Roman Empire was by, by forcing people to worship the ancient, the old gods. Constantine comes along, has the same idea that a consistent faith practice can strengthen the empire, which is what he wanted, but he believed that he should do it through Christianity. Which means he had very practical um, objectives in making sure the church was working well. He believed this was a factor on how well the empire was. So that, starting with Constantine, the emperor, that is the imperial power, 
took it upon themselves to be involved in controversies that affected the church, particularly controversies that, that threatened to split the church. Okay? That far, Dan Brown actually had it right. Constantine was concerned about this. Dan Brown and the Da Vinci goes completely wrong about what Constantine did about it. But the one thing we, we can say he did do about it was he called the first ecumenical council of the church in Nicaea. Nicaea is in Asia Minor. It's not very far from Constantinople. And Constantine called for this first gathering. Ecumenical means universal. Ecumenical is the same as Catholic. It means everybody. Universal. And as an ecumenical council, they brought bishops, only bishops. Nobody else was allowed. Um, I mean, they had secretaries and stuff with them, but it was just like just a regular, ordinary priest couldn't go. Or, and by the way, somebody asked me the question the other day where the word priest came from. It was a variant on presbyter or elder. All of the, all of the ministers were presbyters, which is the Greek word for elder, and it was a, a, a sort of a Latinized twist of the Greek word presbyter gave us priest. So that's where the word priest comes from. Um, so all of these bishops, in 325, Constantine calls together a council of the church. And it involved bishops from all over the empire. Many of these bishops had very recently, because this isn't long after Constantine took over, had very recently been persecuted themselves. There were bishops there who, you know, the bishop of Egypt had one eye because he had had the other one plucked out under torture. There were various other scars these people carried on their body. They had lived their whole lives and the lives of generations before them, for the first 300 years of the church, um, being persecuted by the imperial forces. And now the emperor is inviting them all to come together and he's paying for it. He paid their way. You know, put them up in the Motel 8 there in Nicaea. Um, they all gathered. The emperor was running things and they thought there was, there was an attitude of complete euphoria. You know, the kingdom of God on earth has arrived. That the emperor is calling us all together to decide some issues of the church. Now, the particular thing that caused, apparently Constantine had been thinking about doing this anyway in order to try to strengthen the church, but the particular thing that caused him to, um, to call this council was one of the great heresies that the early church had to face, and that is the heresy of Arianism. I want to give you a little background on that, because this is an important one. This one affected not only the early church and the council of Nicaea in the 300s, and you'll see the dates on these, AD 325. But it continued to be an issue that affected the church for a couple hundred years after that, because it wasn't really resolved, even though they thought they'd resolved it. What had happened was, you'll remember when I talked about some of the um, early church fathers, people like Justin Martyr and Clement of Alexandria and Origen. Um, these guys were very intellectual. They had come out of a study of Greek philosophy, they were not willing to completely discard Greek philosophy because they saw the wisdom in it. And in fact, a lot of the Greek philosophers, you know, Plato and others, said there's only one God, that God is eternal, the soul is eternal, you know, people never really die. All these things that the Greek pagan religions did not believe and did not say. So these, these Greek Christian intellectuals, the, the apologists and the early church fathers, they looked at these philosophies, that is particularly Platonic philosophy and Stoic philosophy, and said, the basic things they're saying is completely consistent with Christianity. God must have given them that truth, so our job is to figure out, in order to be an intellectual, you remember one of the accusations against early Christianity was, you're stupid. Anybody who wasn't stupid wouldn't believe this stuff. And so these intellectuals come along, and they figure out how to articulate the Christian faith in an, in an intellectual way that takes into account the great Greek classical learning, especially some of the philosophies. So they are, are working with this idea, how do we incorporate classical Greek philosophy into the Christian faith in a way that will be accepted, and in a way that people will know that Christianity isn't inherently stupid, you know, that you can be intelligent and believe this. Now, there were two ways that they, they ran into problems because especially some of the Old Testament when the Old Testament stories where you have rape and you have, you know, um, all kinds of horrible stuff going on, it was very difficult for Greek culture to understand that. The Greeks, for instance, really didn't understand the whole idea of circumcision. Okay? You're going to cut something off your body because God told you to? That did not sound right to them. The two approaches that were taken by these uh, Christian intellectual philosophers 
was either one, to do allegorical interpretations of scriptural passages. In other words, whenever scripture had something that didn't sound like it's something God would really have said or done, they would reinterpret it and say, well, that actually means something different. Okay, That's not recommended. That's actually what a lot of people, including Augustine, who I hope we get time to talk to him about today, Augustine did that with the parables. Okay, I, I mentioned in class, um, was it yesterday? Yes. Yeah, Life and Teachings of Jesus. That Augustine took the parable of the prodigal son and he said, okay, well, you know, the man who was uh, beaten was the church and the ones who beat him up were the devil and his demons and the one who picked him up, the good Samaritan, was Jesus and the, you know, the animal he put him on, you know, and, and the innkeeper was Paul and all this kind of stuff. And it, it got a little ridiculous. But that's one of the ways in which they tried to take the difficult parts, especially the Old Testament and some of the New Testament, and make it fit in. But the other and more important way they did this is through the doctrine of the Logos. Logos, L-O-G-O-S, capital L-O-G-O-S. Logos is a Greek word which means word, literally. In, in principle, it actually means the, uh, the word, or, or perhaps better, the reason of God, the reasoning ability of God. One of the problems in Greek philosophy was that God, if God is the supreme, all eternal, you know, all knowing, creative being, then he's completely immutable. He can't change. He's completely impassable. He cannot be affected by anything from outside. Well, how then do we have an incarnate Jesus who weeps and who loves and who, you know, is reconciled to Peter and does all of these very human things if he was the Word? Well, that. John 1, which says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Greek word is logos. The early Christian Greek philosophers identified the logos as that part of God which is personal and capable of direct relationship with the world, and capable of loving, and capable of relating to human beings. So that there is the supreme being God, but one aspect of God is this, this reason capability, this, this Word. And that's the part that became incarnate in the Son, Jesus. Okay? You good with you, you good so far with that? That use of the idea or concept of logos, which was a had existed in Greek philosophy before, was how they explained how God, the immutable, impassable God, related to a mutable world, a changeable world. Now, those views were especially important in the eastern part of the church because that's where Greek philosophy was most dominant. It wasn't really that big an issue in the West, in Latin, in the Latin church. That's all well and good until you maybe go too far in using Greek philosophy as your way of understanding the faith. That happened in Alexandria, which was the center of Greek learning, Alexandria in Egypt. In Alexandria, there was a bishop named Alexander. Alexander of Alexandria. It almost sounds like a chain store, okay? Um, he was bishop, and probably the most popular presbyter or elder, minister under him, was a man named Arius. He was a powerful preacher, really popular, had lots of fans, um, and Arius began to teach and preach that this logos of God, this word of God, was created by God. That the word of God was not co-eternal with God. In fact, the slogan line that they used with regard to the word or the logos was, there was a time when it was not. Okay? Now, they're still saying that the, the word or logos was pre-incarnation, meaning it existed before Jesus became a human being. But Arius taught that there is the immutable, eternal, supreme being God, and the first thing God did right out of the chute was he made, created, the logos, the word. And then through that word, all things were created, and nothing was made that has been made, according to John. Alexander insisted that that can't be. Because if you say the Word was a created thing by God, the, God the Supreme Being, you're saying Jesus is not co-eternal with the Father. That Jesus is a created being. And so they argued back and forth. And each one of them had scriptures that they thought defended their side, their favorite proof, proof text. They also each had logical arguments. For instance, um, Arius claimed that if you believe that the Word or Logos is co-eternal with God the Father, then you believe in two gods. It's not monotheism anymore. And um, 
Alexander shot back and said, well, Arius, if you believe the word, the Logos, which is Jesus Christ, it became incarnate in Jesus Christ, if you believe that was created, then it's not really God. And we worship Jesus Christ, and are we therefore supposed to either stop worshiping him or accept the fact that we're worshiping a created being and not God? And they went back and forth. Now, this started out as just an argument in Alexandria. The problem was that Alexander, who was the bishop, when Arius would not retract his teaching, Alexander um, threw him out of his church, basically said, you can't be a pastor anymore, and you're not allowed to teach anymore, and he publicly renounced all of the teaching that Arius had done. Well, Arius was very popular, he was also very smart, and he was also very politic. He didn't take it. He started writing letters to all the bishops who had been friends of his that he had gone to school with in Antioch, and he had a whole bunch of bishops write back and say, we believe Arius is right and you're wrong, Alexander. So other bishops lined up against the Bishop of Alexandria, whose name is Alexander. Um, and so this became, a, you know, there was a threat that the whole eastern part of the church was going to split in two over this. What started as a local disagreement between a priest and a, and a bishop. Well, this got to be such a big deal that um, Constantine decided he, as the emperor, and again, he's thinking about getting everybody together because he wants to make the church strong. He sees this as threatening the unity of the church. First thing he does is he sends his personal religious counselor, who was Bishop uh, Hosius of Cordoba from Spain, who himself still carried scars from persecution. He sent him to Alexandria to see if they could work it out. Well, um, Hosius got the, cost the almost the next flight back and said, you know, no, we're not going to solve this one just by talking to people. You know, this is going to take some more authority. So Constantine said, fine, I'll do what I was thinking about doing now. Call all the bishops together. So in 325, all of the bishops from all over the, um, the empire, mostly from the east, because that's where it was held, but a lot of Europeans as well, came together. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 bishops, many of whom, as I said, had been persecuted a very short time before this. They get together, they uh, see themselves, there are a number of issues that need to be dealt with now that they're legal. Um, they look at several legislative matters, um, they determine standard procedures for how they readmit people who previously had lapsed, that is, who renounced the faith. They set up policies for electing and ordaining presbyters, uh, ministers, basically elders and bishops, they also, and I'll talk about this in a few minutes when we talk about popes, they set up a sequence of priorities in terms of the Episcopal sees. S-E-E-S-C. Um, sees are the cities where an archbishop or a patriarch lived. They're the main centers of Christianity. And there were four of those. We'll talk about that. But the main thing they had to deal with was the Arian controversy. And there are two, two um, small groups who represented the opposite sides. There were small groups of bishops, a small group of bishops who supported Arius, led by Eusebius of Nicom Nicomedia. Now, don't confuse Eusebius of Nicomedia, which was a town very nearby Nicaea in Constantinople. Don't confuse him with Eusebius of Caesarea, who's the main historian of the early church. If it were not for Eusebius of Caesarea, we wouldn't know very much at all about the early church. He was the primary historian. He also had a bromance with Constantine. Uh, by that, I mean, <laughs> simply, he thought. Constantine was the hand of God and the greatest greatest guy ever. And so he wrote he wrote a life of Constantine and thought he was just spectacular. So, but this other this other Eusebius, Eusebius of Nicomedia, was a friend of Arius's, believed him, and he had a couple of other bishops supporting him. Arius was not there because he wasn't a bishop. And so he wasn't allowed to be there. They thought, well, you guys disagree with this simply because you don't understand it. Then there was another small group of bishops who opposed Arius and the Arian ideas, the Arian controversy it's called, led by Alexander, the guy who had disagreed with Arius about all this, and a few bishops who supported him. Well, Eusebius of Nicomedia presents his ideas, thinking that, okay, you guys were reasonable, I'll explain this to you and then you'll be fine. But when he got to the part where he said that the word of God was created, which means the Son was created, all heck broke loose. These other bishops who the Eusebius thought, I'll just explain it, and they'll all agree. It's simple. They're smart. They started screaming blasphemy, heresy, you lie. They forced him to sit down. They snatched his speech out of his hand, tore it up, stomped on it, and agreed, we got to do something to shut this down right now. 
Okay, and Eusebius and his, his supporters are just like, what? What is going on here? Um, I'll mention one other small group that was there because this comes into the conversation. There was a small group of people who were called Patropassianists. Patropassianism was the idea that the Father and the Son really are the same thing. And so therefore, it's called Patropassianism because that means the Father, God the Father, suffered the passion along with Jesus. So they thought the Father and the Son were the same thing, just sort of showing up at different times. Kind of a modalism. But anyway, that becomes important. Remember that, Patropassianism, that the Father suffered the passion. Well, when Eusebius is shouted down, the, everybody gets together, and they, um, Eusebius of Caesarea, the historian, says, guys, let me read you a creed that we've been using in Caesarea and see what you think of this. He read his creed. Everybody liked it. Constantine, according to tradition, suggested they add a key word, which is the word homoousios. Homoousios means of the same substance, same material, same thing. And they ended up with this. This may sound somewhat familiar, not exactly. They declared, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, that is, from the substance, homoousios, of the Father, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, Arius, stick that in your pipe and smoke it, um, of one substance, homoousios, with the Father, through whom all things were made, both in heaven and on earth, who for us humans and for our salvation descended and became incarnate, becoming human, suffered and rose again on the third day, ascended to the heavens, and will come again to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> they, they added later. <laughs> but those who say that there was when he was not, that was sort of the cry, they actually used it as a jingle, Arius' followers, there was when he was not. In other words, there was a time when he was not. Those who say there was when he was not, and that before being begotten he was not, or that he came from that which is not, or that the Son of God is of a different substance or essence, or that he is created or mutable, these, the Catholic Church, anathematizes. Curses. That we, you know, we reject them. We throw them out. Okay? So that formula, with some later additions, became what we know as the Nicene Creed, because it came from the Council of Nicaea. It is the most universally accepted creed to this day. The Apostles' Creed, which we also use in our church, the Apostles' Creed was from Rome. It was Latin. And only the Western Church, which means now Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, recognize that. None of the Eastern churches do. But both East and West, because this came out of an ecumenical council with everybody, recognize the, count, the, um, the Nicene Creed. That's coming out of the Council of Nicaea. Now, the issue I mentioned about the homo usios, of the same substance, that was expected to be the thing that would drive the nail in the coffin of Arius and stop this controversy. The problem was we had this small group of patropassianists who said the Father and the Son were the same thing, and therefore the Father had suffered the passion on the cross along with the Son. Well, when you say the Father and the Son are of the same substance, the patropassianists were going, yay, that's what we say. And everybody else went, no, 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 that's not what we meant. <laughs> and so because of that additional problem, there was still controversy over that. Some people proposed that instead of homoousios, which means of the same substance, it should be homoousios, which means of similar substance. <laughs> but that didn't satisfy everybody. Mm -hmm. And so they say that this, this controversy went on for years and years and years and years and years basically a century and a half, I think, that an iota, <laughs> the smallest of Greek letters, split the church over this issue, which is the difference between homoousios and homoousios, is an iota, a, a small Greek letter. So still they declared this, and, very, and they required that everybody sign it, and a few of them refused. For instance, Eusebius of Nicomedia refused to sign, and a few of the other bishops who were supporting Arius, just a few, Everybody else signed, and this became the law of the land. Well, they then said, what are we going to do with these guys that refuse to agree? They deposed them. They took their bishoprics away from them. You know, they no longer were bishops. And then Constantine did something that later on would have great significance. Constantine was afraid that if, if um, 
Eusebius goes back to Nicomedia, for instance, he's no longer bishop, he can create all kinds of problems. Okay, because he can claim he is still a bishop. Once he gets back home, you know, it's gonna be gonna be problems. So Constantine steps in and says that, okay, you guys, you bishops, um, threw them out as bishops, I exile them from their homes. They can't go back home again unless they cause problems. That was the first instance where the imperial power was used to affect leadership in the church. And later on, that would be used to great detriment. But you can see how that set a precedent where the emperor would decide what's going to happen with church leaders and became a huge issue later on. Now, the Council of Nicaea did not end this issue. Eusebius of Nicomedia was a, a very political kind of guy. He lived not very far away, even though he did, couldn't go back to Nicomedia. He stuck around. He sort of got in with the emperor. He finally convinced the emperor that Arius wasn't all that bad. So uh, the emperor allowed Arius to come back. He allowed Eusebius to be reinstated. And over a period of time, the Arians got back in the graces of the emperor and therefore gained power again. So much so that the emperor uh, declared that they had to reinstate Arius to his position as a minister. In, but before they could actually do it, and in fact the, bis the bishop at that time was trying to decide, do I do what I think is right or do I do what, the, what he's ordering me to do, the emperor? And before he could decide, Arius died. Okay. But um, one of the people that was there that was very important, who was the secretary to Alexander of Alexandria at that time, was named Athanasius. Athanasius became one of the strongest and most important advocates for the Nicene decision about this. And against Arianism, as well as being a major advocate for the church against a lot of other controversies, this thing went back and forth. I, I won't go into a lot more of the detail, but after Constantine died, he had already let the Arians get back sort of into power. Three of Constantine's sons, whose names, this is almost like George Foreman, his names were Constantine II, Constance, and Constantius II. Okay? Couldn't swing a dead cat without it. somebody with Constance. <laughs> Um, so his three sons took over, and they disagreed, and they took over various parts of the kingdom. Then they started fighting each other, and at various times, depending upon where you were, either the emperor supported Arius, or the Arian controversy, Arius was dead, or supported Nicaea, and what they said. And it went back and forth. And at various times, depending on who was in power, various guys got exiled. Athanasius, who took over as leaders in this after Alexander of Alexandria died, he became the Bishop of Alexandria, was exiled six times and always came back. All right? And he was also closely associated with the monks, the monastic movement in Egypt, because he was in Alexandria. Um, and so he, it was back and forth and back and forth. The thing that stopped this controversy, oddly enough, between when the, la the third, the last of uh, Constantine's sons, Constantius, finally died unexpectedly. The person who succeeded him was his cousin, that is Constantine's nephew, Julian, who was a pagan. He didn't believe in Christianity. Now, he did not persecute Christians, but he did begin to take active steps to try to reinstate worship of the gods. For that reason, even though he was actually quite a good general and he was quite a good leader, a ruler, you know, he did he did well by the empire, it, it did well under him, and he didn't he, he wasn't there very long, he was eventually killed in battle against the Persians, but he's called Julian the Apostate. That's what he's labeled as. Nobody ever pays attention to the fact that he actually was a pretty good ruler, and he didn't actively persecute the church, but he tried to re encourage the old temples and the worship of the old gods. That didn't last very long, but when he came on board, he, um, he was just fine with letting them argue about, you know, Arius, Athanasius, Arius, Athanasius, Athanasius, Arius, Nicaea, you know. Uh, he didn't want to do anything about that. When Athanasius, the bishop who got exiled six times over this issue, when he started sort of winning, then Julian, the apostate, tried to have him arrested, actually tried to exile him, and when he showed up, Athanasius disappeared, went off into the desert. And they left, and when they came back, you know, Athanasius comes back from that exile. Uh, after a while, Julius sends them back to get him again, and he goes off into the desert. There's one wonderful story that uh, Athanasius was on a boat cruising up the Nile, and the soldiers from Julian are coming after him. And as the boat approaches, and Athanasius is standing on the back deck of the, of the boat, they say, have you seen Athanasius? And 
Athanasius sort of looks around and says, He's in a boat just in front of you. If you hurry, you can catch him. <laughs> Absolutely true. But they race by Athanasius' boat thinking he's somewhere else up the river. So there are all these wonderful stories about that. Um, this issue continued to go back and forth, and it had to be dealt with in several of the councils of the church. Okay? Uh, it was not easily put, put down. Questions about that, and, and again, the reason I mentioned that at some length is not just because of the Arian controversy, which is worth knowing about because it affected the church so heavily, but also because it led to the first of the great councils, which is very, very important in terms of our understanding. All right, I want to talk a little bit, just very briefly, about the additional councils uh, that happened in the church. There were seven councils that are called ecumenical. Now, that's not completely accurate because... Um, there are various parts of the church that have not accepted some of these. And uh, Eastern Orthodoxy doesn't accept certain bits and pieces and some of the doctrinal differences that, it, that developed between Western Christianity, Catholicism, and then later, of course, Protestantism, and then Oriental Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy, etc. Um, came from differences in terms of which of the councils were acceptable to everybody. The First Council of Nicaea, which we've just been talking about, not only repudiated Arianism, the Arian uh, heresy, and created the original version of the Nicene Creed, it also fixed the date of Easter, and it recognized the primacy of the sees of Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch as the three great... What happened was, as the church grew, and you had presbyters, elders... And then, in order to simply try to be organized, you would have bishops. Bishops were like senior elders that would be either over the pastors, you know, the ministers. Presbyter means elder, and ministers were elders. Still, as a, as a minister, I technically am an elder of the word and sacrament, as opposed to a lay elder. But still, that's my title, I'm an elder. So, some of the elders were made kind of senior elders, overseeing the others. Well, they started being called bishops, which is actually a version of the word presbyter. Okay? Then, as the church continued to grow, and especially when it became legal, they recognized that the bishops who were the senior ministers in large cities, the primary cities of the empire, actually had more eminence, they, were, they had more authority, they were responsible for more stuff, and let's face it, size always makes a difference in terms of you know, where, where you respect. So the bishops that were in charge of Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch became archbishops and later began to be called patriarchs. That's where you get the patriarch of Constantinople is still the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Okay? Those were patriarchies. The Council of Nicaea established Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch as the three primary sees, and they gave a place of honor, an honorary see, to Jerusalem as the... the center from which the church had grown, although the church in Jerusalem at that time was not very significant, so it was only honorary. So you've got Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch were identified as the key centers of the Christian church in, out of the Council of Nicaea. The second council, which was called in 381, so we're looking at less than 60 years later, was the first council of Constantinople. This is in the capital city now, the Constantine established. That, again, had to repudiate Arianism because it had not died. It was still flaring up all the time. It also uh, revised the Nicene Creed, gave a little bit more content. Remember when I read you the first version, it said, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, and then went on to something else. It expands our understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. Um, it also added Constantinople as a see. So that made four primary centers of the Christian church. Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, and Constantinople, with an honorary place for Jerusalem. It also then um, put down, or declared as heretical, the a heresy called um, the Apollinarian heresy, or Apollinarianism. Say that three times fast. Uh, Apollinarianism had said that the, at the Incarnation, the divine word, or logos, was so much more powerful than the human nature in Jesus, and that it sort of just overwhelmed it. So it kind of denied the humanity of Jesus. And the Council of Constantinople, new, new heresies were coming along still all the time. It was sort of the heresy of the week. Almost. So they put down the heresy of Apollinarianism at the First Council of Constantinople. The Third Council was the Council of Ephesus. 
It repudiated the heresy of Nestorianism. Nestorius had been a preacher in Antioch, and the church had, had started saying that Mary, this is where the, the uh, elevation of the Virgin Mary started happening, they had actually given Mary the title um, that means the God-bearer, or the mother of God. Theotokos is the Greek word. The, the bearer of God. That she gave birth to God. And by saying that, you know, we believe Jesus was divine, he's the son of God, she gave birth to him, so she is the God-bearer. And so that kind of elevated her. Well, the stories came along and said, I'm not willing to say that she was the bearer of God, because that says things about Mary that I don't think are appropriate. It was perceived as being a denial of the divinity of Jesus, rather than a critique on the nature of Mary. And so Nestorius was put down, and they reaffirmed that Mary was Theotokos, the God-bearer. It also repudiated Pelagianism. Pelagianism was sort of a new Gnosticism that came along. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later when I talk about Augustine, because Augustine was the primary um, opponent to Pelagianism. And they reaffirmed, third council to do this, they reaffirmed the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> there is also a council that happens in just uh, 18 years later, the second council of Ephesus. It's not up here because it declared that a doctrine that was being taught by um, a preacher named Eutyches, they declared it to be orthodox and they attacked his opponents. Everybody else in the church got together right after that and said, no. We, there were only a few people invited to that one, okay? Um, the Emperor Theodosius had invited just a select few, and they all agreed before they started on this thing. So they declared Eutychus to be correct, and it later was declared to be a robber council. It was called robber council. They stole the doctrine. And it was rejected by Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestants. Only the Oriental Orthodox held to that. Well, as a result of that, that second council of Ephesus, which is not an ecumenical council, because not everybody went and most people didn't like it, we have the council of Chalcedon came up after that in AD 451. It repudiated Eutychus and the Eutychian doctrine that had been identified. Now, the Eutychian doctrine was one uh, that declared uh, monophytism, which means one, you know, one nature. Eutychus said that when the human nature and the divine nature got together, the human nature was so insignificant in comparison, it was like putting a drop of honey in the ocean and expecting it to show up. And so he sort of denied the human aspect of, of, G, of Jesus. They repudiated that. They adopted the, the creed of Chalcedon, or the Chalcedonian creed, which is the predominant uh, Trinitarian creed. Trinity is, is identified in the Nicene creed and others, but it is much more heavily emphasized in the, in the Creed of Chalcedon. Um, they, and they elevated at that, that council at Chalcedon, which is in Asia Minor, near Constantinople, they elevated Constantinople as being equal to Rome, as being preeminent seas. Because prior to that, the pattern had developed because Peter had been the rock on which Jesus would build his church, and he was declared to be the first bishop of Rome by Rome. Um, that they began to take precedence as the, as the top dog see, the, the main city. And the Bishop of Rome was beginning to take on what we today see as the papal authority. Well, the Council of Chalcedon said, okay, Rome, you're fine with that, but equal to you is Constantinople. Later on, you could see that was setting the, the, the stage for the split because the Bishop of Rome, the Pope of the Catholic Church, and the Bishop of Constantinople, the Patriarch of the Orthodox Church, they had been declared equal to one another. Neither one over the other, and it ended up leading to a split. There were other things we'll talk about next week. But that's where they said that Constantinople was equal. Equal then the Second Council of Constantinople, and you notice that um, all of these things are happening in the East. All right? They're all in Asia Minor, or thereabouts. So the Second Council of Constantinople repudiated um, a particular heresy as being Nestorian, since they had already uh, put down Nestorianism. And then the Third Council of Constantinople repudiated two doctrines uh, that, that dealt with, um, I don't want to get into that, uh, monothelitism and monoenergism, um, having to do with the nature of God. And then the Second Council of Nicaea restored the veneration of icons. 
The Western Church didn't like icons. The Eastern Church liked icons. Remember, you, you Eastern Orthodox icons, right? They do these beautiful paintings of the saints and of Mary and of Jesus. Well, there was a period in there in which the Western influence sort of gained precedence. They decided that the veneration of icons was false idol worship. And they said, you can't do that anymore. That had been reputed in the Council of uh, Hyeria, which was not a, an ecumenical council. Well, the Second Council of Nicaea in 787 restored the veneration of icons, and it repudiated iconoclasm. Iconoclasm means the, the denial or destruction, literally, of icons. These were the seven ecumenical councils. After this, the splits, the divisions became more and more and more, and there were no more councils that were declared to be ecumenical, even though some aspects of Eastern Orthodoxy especially didn't agree with all of these, or all that came out of these, okay? But that was significant, and, and it's fair to say that these councils, they declared that uh, Arius was wrong, and in doing so, they affirmed that Jesus really was truly God, not created. They declared that Apollinarius was wrong, because Jesus was truly a man. He wasn't just, you know, a shell that got taken over by the, by the power of God. They, they declared against Eutychus, who said that, um, that Jesus' humanity was still there, but it was just overwhelmed by the divinity. And against Nestorius, who said that um, the... Two essences of Jesus were only one, okay? The two natures, as we talk about it, was only one, monophytism. So all of these different heresies that were coming up, the councils dealt with those, as well as all the other political stuff that was going on in the church. They are critical to understanding the history of how the church developed its doctrine, which was the basis on which the church grew, all right? Um, I mentioned to you Athanasius. In this whole Arian controversy that went along, Athanasius, who had been the secretary to Alexander of Alexandria, who started the opposition to Arius, Athanasius was the one that took this up, got exiled six times for it. He is the one that declared it has to be homoousios, same substance. The word Jesus is the same substance as the Father, not homoousios. But later on, Athanasius himself, a great champion of this, figured out that, yeah, there is a real problem if people interpret homoousios as meaning the Father and the Son are the same thing, the patropassionists, okay? And so he began, finally he was able to uh, broker a theological agreement where they said, okay, it's fine to say that they are the same substance, but they are distinct in person. So... The Father, even though they're the same substance, the Father wasn't actually there on the cross with the Son. And he worked out all the details of that, even though he still ended up being exiled six times and continued to his very death having to battle this controversy and others in the church. And uh, finally, when uh, after Julian the Apostate died, the next emperor that came on board, who was a Christian, his name was Valens, Valens was a staunch Arian. Okay, back to that again. And so Athanasius is thinking, oh, here we go again. Exile number seven, coming up. Um, but instead, Valens was smart enough to say, this Athanasius has, has defeated an apostate emperor and has defeated three emperors before that, the people who inherited after Constantine. None of them got the better of him. He's not going to quit. I better leave him alone. <laughs> And then over a period of time, the whole, um, Athanasius did not live to see the final victory of the Nicene Creed and of the, they later were called the Chalcedons because the Council of Chalcedon is the one that finally did the most definitive statement. The Chalcedons, the people who followed the, the Creed of Nicaea, defeated Arianism. Uh, Athanasius died before that happened, but he did win. Yes, Eric. Um, I was thinking about exile. Did that just mean they weren't allowed back in the country, or did they send them to a totally different... It could be either one. In the case of Athanasius, they just ordered him, or forced him in some cases, to leave um, to leave Alexandria, okay. to leave his seat, to leave his bishopric. Uh, right. The a couple of those exiles, at least two, maybe three, were he he left himself because they were coming for him. Okay, and uh, he typically he went to the desert because he was very close. Athanasius wrote. Um, the, the life of Anthony, St. Anthony, that I'm going to talk about right now, who is one of the founders of the Egyptian desert, um, 
monastic movements. Athanasius, there are several other leaders that at some point I need to mention, and I'll talk about a little bit more, but we won't have time today. Uh, they would fit in here historically, but Jerome, Jerome was the one who translated the, the Bible into Latin, one of the great scholars of the early church who himself had been a monk. He wrote the life of Paul, the, um, the Anchorite monk. Paul and Anthony are the, not, not the Paul from the Bible, different Paul. Um, Paul and Anthony, Anthony were the two who were most responsible for developing the monastic movement in the Egyptian desert. That is the solitary movement called the Anchorite movement. Anchorite means alone, basically. It means to be cut off from. Um, and Athanasius, who was the defender against Arianism more than anybody else, he wrote the life of Anthony. Jerome, who translated the Bible into Latin, wrote the life of the monk Paul. Okay, so. Those two were very influential in spreading the idea of monasticism by their writings. And Athanasius, therefore, was very close to the monks in the desert, and uh, at least twice that I know of, I could be wrong about that, but I think twice, when they were coming for him, he just went off into the desert. And because these monks lived off in tombs and caves and various other places, they couldn't find him. And then when the heat was off, he came back. Okay, John? I was just going to say, you know, when you look at 400 years of this, and we go to church Sunday and we'll listen to this place in a very nice, polite order. When you look at this 400 years, these men struggled and wrestled and, and wrestled, really wrestled with forming what we believe and take for granted today. Yeah. It makes me very, very grateful. Yeah, we do. We take the Christian doctrine for granted. And yet there were hundreds of years where they really, this had to be ironed out. Because... Um, and it still happens today. You know, one person will take one scripture verse and interpret it in isolation to say one thing. Somebody else will take a different scripture verse and interpret it in isolation to mean something else. At some point, the church had to decide on the big issues who's right, and that's what this was all about. Don't don't you think we've kind of kind of uh, drifted into this you know uncertainty of scripture because now we, we don't have councils like this. When there is a doctrinal threat against the body of Christ, Christian and Christianity as as regular, we we just this church will embrace what it believes, this church believes what it believes, and so on. And there's no there's no formal bringing together like there was in this time yeah. to confront the false doctrine. Heresies. Well, and part of it's because there is no central authority anymore. Carolyn and I have friends who live in Hawaii. We went to visit them, and they're both. I mean, they're, they're both ex-bankers, they're very well to do, they have an extraordinary place right across the street from the water in uh, Maui, um, which ain't cheap, you know, they're very successful, and again, very well educated, very, and I was so shocked one night, because we had dinner with them on Maui, and um, our friend, the woman, uh, who, who is just brilliant, she would refer to some statement that a fundamentalist preacher, a very high profile fundamentalist preacher, had just said something really stupid that the media had picked up, something really insensitive. And she said, why doesn't somebody stop him from saying stuff like that? And I said, well, there really isn't anybody who has sufficient authority to say you can't do that. If he were Catholic, there would be. And she, and she looked at us like puzzled. She said, you mean there's nobody that's really over the Christian thing? <laughs> There's no one person that sort of can tell Christians what they ought to do or not. And I said, no, not unless you're Catholic. That's or if you're right. Eastern Orthodox, maybe the Patriarch of Constantinople. But with a Protestant, no. That's why you know? so many different breakoffs and different churches. Exactly. And so many people saying so many stupid things. Okay. And I think that some of the heresies, one of the reasons it's important for us to study this, is that some of the heresies continue to come back in one form or another. I, and I'm not speaking against Pentecostalism, because some, I have no wonderful, godly, spiritual Pentecostals, but I think there are many Pentecostals that um, are under the heresy of Montanism. They believe that the, the, the Holy Spirit has given a revelation that takes precedence over everything else, over doctrine and over history and over... Even what Jesus said, because the Holy Spirit is active in the body of the day. That's Montanism. That's a heresy that was put down in the second century. And I think there are people who are guilty of that today and don't know enough about the history of the church to know that that's the case. Bob? Who decided who got to go to these councils and who didn't? Well, the, usually it was an invitation of the emperor. And I'm going to talk in just a second about how the influence of the emperor was not accepted or, or thought of as a good thing by everybody. 
but usually it was the emperor. It was the emperor Theodosius II that called the Second Council of Ephesus, for instance, and he only invited who he wanted to invite. That's why that council is not listed. You know, it came after the, um, just like 20 years after the Council of Ephesus, the first Council of Ephesus, and the rest of the church around the world said no. They called it a robber council and said, that's not valid. We're not going to accept that. For the most part, the reason these are called ecumenical is the invitation went out quite broadly to bishops throughout Christendom. And that's why, for the most part, these are accepted uh, by everybody. The one or two, there were other councils that were held. There was a council in Hippo that Augustine actually was oversaw and others. But they're not called ecumenical because they were more limited. These are the ones that, by definition, were supposed to have included everybody. But there were a lot of other gatherings that were happening. That was happening on a fairly regular basis, regionally and whatnot. Okay. Good question. No yeah. Question. Uh, in today's period, would would something like uh, uh, the Lausanne conference be somewhat a contemporary image of one of these things? Well, you all know what the Luzon Conference is. The Luzon Conference on World Evangelization. The first one met in the '60s, I think. I think so. um, and it was the leaders of it were Billy Graham and you know Bill Bright and some of the significant Christian leaders around the world. John Stott, uh, others. There was a new Luzon gathering that actually met in South Africa just a year ago. Uh, and a friend of mine, who's actually the CEO of the company I do consulting with, was the one of the directors of that conference. He was in charge of communication. That's not a council of the church in the same way, because they gather to encourage the church, and particularly to encourage evangelization. How do we share the message? They don't, uh, unlike the councils, they, they did not act and do, you know, have not acted in any sort of... Um, the of the gospel. Well, there, there, was, there were no doctrinal determinations. Exactly. They, did, they came out with some statements mostly as statements of encouragement, but they did not make doctrinal determinations. And virtually all of these councils, there were at least at least part of what they did, important parts of what they did, was to make decisions about doctrinal, you know, rightness and wrongness. So you would see that like in the Council of the Presbyterian Churches or the Baptist Church, where they have their, their big meetings right. and, and they would define their doctrinal stance. Right. Well, the Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council, those are examples in the Catholic Church where they did the same thing within... Roman Catholicism. They have representatives from all over the world come together. Of course, that didn't include Eastern churches. It didn't include Protestantism. Um, but they did. They made decisions that changed the direction of the church. Doctrinal issues. Kevin? I mean, I think the best way to sum that up was these councils defined our message, mm -hmm. and whereas the modern councils are more of how to spread the message, exactly. not redefining it. it the, the modern, like the Lausanne meetings, have been encouragement. They've been coming up with language people can be inspired by and encouraged by and use as kind of a focal point for things, but no doctrinal determinations, okay? And, they're, and they were, but they were ecumenical in the sense that they invited people from all different branches of Christendom. Okay, we've only dealt with the first of four topics. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll have classes every day if we have to get this done. Um, Wait, what? <laughs> I want to talk now about the monastic movements. Um, as I suggested a minute ago, with uh, it's a whole new world for the church when Constantine takes over. The emperor is now, if not himself a Christian, supporting the Christian church. He's getting involved by calling councils. He's getting involved by making decisions about depose, you know, not deposing the church deposed bishops, but by exiling bishops to keep them from going back and causing trouble. And so the empire, the imperial forces, are now involved in the church in a way that's never existed before this in the Christian church. So the monastic movement was a reaction against this newly legalized imperial, if you will, church. That is, it, the church did not become the church of the empire for quite a while until the emperor Theodosius, not under Constantine, but he made it legal. There were some people who actually saw this as a huge negative for, in terms of the spiritual health and well-being of the church. Um, they looked at scripture and they saw all, all sorts of places where Jesus talked about the danger of wealth, the danger of power, uh, the fact that Christians were supposed to serve each other. And Jesus said, you know, you're not supposed to be like the Gentile rulers who fight over each other to see who can be in charge. Well, right after
after Constantine takes over, you have bishops who are fighting each other for particular positions of importance. You have wealthy people really, really controlling aspects of the church. Um, you have all sorts of difficulties in terms of negative impact on the spiritual life of the church. Remember, prior to Constantine, the church had gone through almost 300 years of constant fear of persecution. So you knew that the people who were committed to the faith were prepared to suffer. Now granted, when persecution came a few times because the people had been a while without it, they didn't respond very well. But still, there was always the knowledge that if you accept Christ, there could be a heavy price to pay. Now, there's no negative and there's all sorts of positive. There's political influence to be gained by this. You, you know, their money could be made. Instead of them, you know, worshiping in tombs, the emperor is paying to build these giant churches full of gold and jewels, you know, palaces for the bishops to live in, and all kinds of stuff. The challenge to people who were serious about the faith at that point was, how do we live a true Christian life when this is what the church is turning into? How do we stand against the enormous temptations of life when those temptations have become part of the church? How do we represent the cause of Christ and witness to a crucified Lord when wealthy people are being appointed to all these key positions in the church instead of poor people? How do you deal with that? Well, a great many people found the, the answer to those questions in opposition to the changes in the church that came under Constantine. And I'm not blaming Constantine. It was human nature when he made it legal and started paying for everything you know, that people started acting that way. A lot of people found the answer in monastic life, to flee from human society, to leave everything behind, to leave behind the, all of the temptations, and to as much as possible to deny the temptations of the flesh, gluttony, lust, and various other sins. In many cases, the thing we have to see is that um, a, lot of the, a lot of the people who chose monastic life may have chosen to flee from the temptations of life. Many of them were fleeing from the temptations of the church. They were fleeing what the church had become almost more than they were fleeing the world because they wanted to have a serious, sincere, spiritual life. And they thought this might be one way to give it, get it. Now, prior to the monastic movement, and when we talk about the monastic movement, we especially are talking about the, the movement that started. There had been monks all along. There had been people, you know, Origen uh, castrated himself to become a eunuch for the Lord. Bad idea. You know, I don't think anybody thinks that he was right in doing that now. Uh, but there had been people who had denied themselves and lived very, uh, you know, very ascetic kind of lives as a spiritual discipline before this. But now we're talking about a major movement. We're talking about literally tens of thousands of people choosing to move someplace where they could be alone and away from the temptations of the world, away from what they saw as the apostasy of the church as a whole. Um, there are people from that time who said they would go to the, Egypt, to the Egyptian desert and there were more people in the desert than there were in the towns. <laughs> At one point they said there were as many as 10,000 monks spread out across the Egyptian desert, male monks, and as many as 20,000 women. You know, and they were going there, they would find a tomb or uh, a secluded valley, you know, desert valley, or someplace else where they could be alone. And the biggest danger that they found was that pretty soon somebody else would show up and then they'd have to go somewhere else. Okay? <laughs> Um, this is something that happened over and over again. Now again, there have been people prior to Constantine and prior to the Egyptian desert monastic movement that had practiced a sort of a limited kind of asceticism. For instance, you have the, the widows and virgins. Originally, when the church started, there were widows who had no husbands, who had no way to support themselves. The church started taking care of them. And in return for that, in appreciation, they started working for the church. Well, after a period of time, um, Widows who did have means, or single women who had means, would voluntarily come and serve the church. They would give up all of their resources, and the church would take care of them. And that was a kind of asceticism, where they gave up wealth, they gave up potential for other things in order to serve the church. Well, at a certain point, there are only so many widows that can you know you can take care of. Uh, and so a lot of there are more women wanting to do this now than there was room for in the churches, and so. Some of them turned to the monastic movement. Now, um, the first monks were uh, anchorite monks. 
Monsevs, the correct Monsevs movement? It's monastic movement. Um, There's two letters. Yeah. Anchorites, uh, anchorite literally means to be cut off from, to be separated from. So the original monastic movement in the Egyptian desert, and again, why the Egyptian desert? Well, the second biggest city in the empire was um, Alexandria. And immediately around Alexandria, you walk a little ways away from the Nile, and you've got a desert. There's not a lot of desert, around, not, not a lot of secluded places around Rome, which was the biggest city in the empire. And so Alexandria and the desert that surrounded it was a logical place for them to be. Initial, and, and the word monk, I should say, comes from the Greek word monakos, which means solitary. So anchorite monks is almost redundant. It means those who are separated from and those who are solitary. They would go off by themselves in order to practice a withdrawn life to uh, pray, to get away from the temptations of life. It's possible that the first monks were Anthony, well, it's not possible. Anthony and Paul were not the first monks, but they were the first ones to become well-known, and probably were fairly early leaders. Um, as, I, as I told you, well-known because Athanasius, famous Athanasius of the Six Exiles, he wrote the life of Anthony. Jerome, who translated the Bible into Latin, and that Latin Vulgate, it's called, became the, the uh, Bible, the, until quite recently, actually, became the official Bible of the Catholic Church, they, uh, Jerome wrote a life of Paul, and so these two, and both of them, by the way, claimed that their guy was the one who started the monastic anchorite movement in, in Egypt. They both couldn't have it. In fact, the story of Anthony is that he went to a monk who was already in the desert and learned from him. So clearly, he couldn't have been the first one. So they go off. Uh, the, the story of Anthony, for instance, is that he was born in a small village from fairly wealthy parents. Um, he, his parents died and they left him enough money to live comfortably and take care of his sister. But then shortly after their death, um, he was in church and heard a reading of the gospel account of the rich young ruler. And Jesus said, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And that struck Anthony to the heart, and he decided to do that. At first he gave away most, he left enough money to take care of his sister. And then God compelled him, he felt, in a vision to go the rest of the way. And so he got rid of all of his money, and his sister moved into a, a, uh, a monastic order for women, um, basically a church that was caring for virgins and, and widows. And he began this life. He fasted, sometimes for several days, or, I, or else uh, limited his food to a single meal a day. He lived in a tomb in an abandoned cemetery, Sometimes people would bring him bread. Paul, it said, lived entirely on dates. That's the only thing he ever, ever ate, because they, they were grown on the trees. Um, when he was 35 years old, God told Anthony not to fear, but to move further into the desert. And what kept happening with Anthony is he was such a pious man that people would come to visit him. He developed a reputation around with the other monks who were scattered out. People would come to him, and it would frustrate him because these people would come and say, can we live with you and learn from you? He'd go, no, I want to be alone. Sort of a you know, garbo kind of thing. I want to be alone. Um, and Anthony is famous for having suffered horrendous temptations, um, claiming that the demons came to him, sometimes in physical form. And he was tempted so heartily that there are times he said his efforts to fight off these temptations would leave him physically sore for days. So he struggled greatly. As I mentioned he only, earlier, he only left the desert once he went there in his early 20s. He only left the desert twice. Once in order to go to Alexandria to offer himself for martyrdom, which was rejected. And the second time, during the controversy between Arius and Alexander of Alexandria. Remember, they were both in Alexandria, right? Well, the desert right outside that is where Anthony was, and he'd become the most famous of the... Anchorite monks by then, because of Athanasius' uh, biography, um, the Arians were saying, well, Anthony agrees with us. So Anthony walked from the desert into, into Alexandria to say, actually, I don't. I'm here. And I don't agree with you. I agree with Alexander. You got it wrong, Arius, and because he felt like that was the only way to do it. Those were the only two times he left the desert, uh, from his 20s until his death, which um, he died he lived a very, very long life. Apparently, you know, eating once every few days is probably, appears to be good for you because he, I think that the story is he lived at 356, so he was about 105 when he died. So he lived for 80 years 
in the desert by himself and only came back to civilization twice for particular reasons. Um, now, this monastic life became so popular, more and more people were coming out here. They would, uh, sometimes they would weave baskets and things for two reasons. One, they would sell them to have enough just to live on, to eat a little bit. And also because those were, uh, those disciplines of weaving or things of that sort, sometimes baking bread, kneading the dough, they found that to be a good way to focus on scripture, to pray, to memorize scripture verses, and so they would do fairly, you know, non-involving kind of tasks, both in order to, you know, get enough just to live on, not much, but just enough to live on, and also in order to have time to pray. Now, um, so those two were the most significant in terms of moving forward and developing the reputation. And you've got people like Athanasius and Jerome. Jerome himself was a monk for a while. Um, they began to advocate the spiritual advantages of this monastic life to the point where, even though the monks didn't like it, the, the, monks, the serious Anchorite monks didn't like it, quite frequently, when they needed a new bishop, they would go to the desert and say, God has told us that you should be our new bishop. And they went, I don't want to be a bishop. I want to stay here. Uh, you get people like Martin of Tours. Now, he was in, you know, from France. He, um, as a young man, was inducted into the military against his will. He hated the army, but he had a vision from God that God would preserve him and protect him. And he began to develop a compassionate heart. There's a wonderful story, which is reflected in a lot of different pieces of art, where um, while he was serving, and this is during the days of Julian the Apostate, He's in the military as they're riding into a town, the town of Amiens, a, a beggar who is starving and has no clothing and it sort of drags himself up to Martin of Tours and, you know, pleading for money. And Martin said, I don't have any money. But he takes his cloak off, his cape, he tears it in half and, gives ha and wraps half of it around the beggar. The, the word for cape was capella. Capella became chapel because the, the act of Martin of Tours in giving his cape, they it became such a strong symbol, they started putting capes, a fat piece of fabric to represent that, in the various chapels that they had. And a person who looked after those chapels as the minister was called a chaplain. That comes from the act of Martin of Tours tearing his cape in half, giving half of it to a beggar. And you'll see statues and paintings of that. The other thing that happened is that act and then later, Martin, when he, left, he was released from the military, he went into monastic life. They practically forced him to become a bishop in Tours. When he became a bishop, he insisted on making a monastic cell right outside the church where his offices were, so he could stay there. And when people still were bothering him too much, he built a cell outside the city and insisted on being able to go there. So he never was willing to completely give up monastic life. But his compassion toward other people is the thing that led monastic orders, monks, to develop a compassionate outreach. And later on, monastic orders and monasteries became famous for their care for the poor. St. Francis of Assisi, you know, the idea of being compassionate. In England, prior to Cromwell, um, when, the, when the monastery, well, Henry VIII actually, and then later Cromwell, when Henry VIII destroyed all the monasteries, it used to be that a person could travel from one end of Britain to the other and know that you would always have something to eat and someplace to stay because the monasteries would take anybody in and feed them. That was a development from particularly Martin Fjords and others who developed this compassionate outreach. Now, the next aspect of the monastic movement which became important, which relates sort of to Assisi and some of what I'm saying, is Pacomius, who was the originator of the Cenobitic monastic movement. Uh, the Cenobitism is taken from two Greek words, which means to live together. The difference was the Anchorite monks, Anthony and Paul being the best examples we have, wanted to be alone, they wanted to be solitary. At the most, they might have one other person with them who would be their teacher or that they were teaching, discipling, but for the most part, they wanted to be alone. Pacomius started out, he was a man who um, started out, he was born in 286, so 3rd century. He started out wanting to be an Anchorite monk in the desert because he was born in southern Egypt. Um, he lived for seven years as a young man, as an Anchorite, 
He had been taught by an older Anchorite monk, um, and then he decided to leave his teacher, and he went off by himself, and then he was later joined by his younger brother John, who also became a monk. So the two of them, Pacomius and his younger brother John, were Anchorite monks. God sent a vision to Pacomius that he was, he was supposed to serve humankind. And Pacomius went, I don't want to serve humankind, I want to be left alone to pray, and to study. And that vision kept coming back, and Pacomius tried to deny it. Finally, he decided that, that he prayed about it, and that what God was calling him to do was to build a facility where other monks could come and live together. One of the dangers of the Anchorite monk movement where they were living alone was that there were certain kinds of temptations that were actually worse there, like pride. Some of these monks started feeling that they were the true Christians, and all these bishops and everybody, that they, were, you know, they weren't really following the Lord. And so pride became a problem. Right? It's also true that the issues of showing love to humanity is pretty hard when there's no humanity around. Okay? There were definite downsides to this. So Pacomius felt like God was telling him to collect together some of these people who were called the monastic life, and in, instead of sitting around sort of wasting their time or doing piddly little things, to make it a disciplined life where you were being productive, you were studying, you were working, you had set devotional times. Um, you, one of the other problems with the Anchorite monks is that some of them would go years and years and years and never take communion because they weren't ordained and they couldn't offer communion. And so they might go six or seven years, and then finally a priest would wander through and they'd be able to take communion from it. Okay? So um, Pacomius builds this facility. He invites people to come together into this monastic order, and he, he organizes them with a certain discipline. Well, they think he's too tough and they try to poison him. <laughs> um, and so that, he breaks that one off and says that. Apparently, he had selected the wrong people. He still feels God's calling him to this communal monasticism because the first group he had said that he was too, too tough, he was too rigorous. When he tried the second time, he made it more rigorous. He made it more disciplined. For instance, he instituted the, the uh, standard, what's now the standard monastic vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience which includes not trying to poison the guy in charge. <laughs> From that, the original, or the second, I shouldn't say the original, the second monastic community, the various monasteries, you know, that one grew to more than they could handle. They planted another. That grew, they planted another. Eventually, um, they had nine different cenobitic, which again means living together in Greek, nine different monastic communities, each with several hundred monks in them. And then Pacomius' sister Mary founded similar communities for women. So you had these monastic communities of men and of women, all organized under a common rule that Pacomius had written, and there was a strict structure. I mean, they had a strict hierarchy, since you're supposed to obey your superior, it had to be clear who your superior was. And so everybody had a job, the people who worked in certain kinds of jobs, like if you were a weaver, all the weavers were in one dormitory. You know, they had cells with two months in each and a common room. And whoever, there was a guy in charge of that, and a guy in charge of the gatekeepers, and a guy in charge of the carpenters. Those people all reported to the head of that particular monastic community. The heads of the monastic community all reported to Pacomius and his assistant, who was over all of them, including the women's. Women's were set up the same way. Uh, the focus was work and devotion. They were, not, uh, they were not ascetic to a great extent. For instance, their food, they, um, had fruit, they had fruit, they had vegetables, they had fish, they had fowl. They did not eat red meat. That was one of the things. Um, most of them made their own wine as far as possible. His rule called for them to be as self-sufficient as they could be. And they practiced scholarship. They actually taught each other the classics not just scripture. So they became centers of learning. This is where the monastic orders became places where there was great learning and where they started you know, translating or copying over some of the great writings of the past, both Christian writings and some secular writings that were considered classic. So that monastic ideal, which started first by Anchorite, individual monks, then communities in Egypt, started spreading. There were huge numbers of people, particularly Pacomius' synoptic uh, or synodic uh, monastic movement, 
a lot of people showing up. And what they would do is the gatekeepers, which was one of the sort of groups, they were responsible for the gate, but also for, for uh, bringing in the vitiates, the, the candidates. And when you came, there's only one door that they guarded. You come to the door and you know, they would make you wait for three or four or five days to make sure you're serious. And then you would go through a period of time. You had to sleep outside by the door to show that you meant it. You really wanted to be there. A very strange thing is that a very high percentage of the people who came were not Christians. They saw some advantage to the monastic life as a way of living, of seeking truth. Many of them came in after they came into the monastery, but before they were made official monks, because you had to go through a period as a novitiate, um, they would come to the faith, profess their faith, be baptized, catechized and baptized. Catechized means goes through the training. Be baptized before they could then become monks. And so this became a, a huge deal. People came from all over. And then many of them who came from Asia Minor and various other places from Egypt then went back to where they came from and started their own monasteries. So the monastic movement started in Egypt. It spread to Syria, to Asia Minor, what we call modern-day Turkey. There were monasteries in Italy. In fact, one of the one of the uh, the Order of Saint Benedict, which is one of the most famous of the orders, that is the way that the instructions that you follow as a monk. The rule of Saint Benedict was from Benedict, a monk in Monte Cassino, in uh, near Rome, in Italy. That became one of the, the home of the Benedictine order. You've heard of the Benedictine monks, right? So it spread to Italy. All of it started, though, in uh, in Egypt. And it, one of the things, again, Athanasius, Jerome, all of these people who were not themselves monks, Jerome had been for a while and then was called out to do other things, um, they spread the story of how extraordinary this monastic experience was. And so many, many people were moved by that and really wanted to be part of it. Um, any questions about the monastic order itself? Orders itself? All right? I want, to spend, I want to spend our next 10 minutes talking about popes. Um, I mentioned earlier that, just sort of by natural occurrence, the largest cities in the empires, it started out with, you had ministers, presbyters, elders. Then you would have somebody who sort of was made a senior elder. They started being called bishops. And then in large cities, those bishops started being called archbishops. Later were called patriarchs. And the various councils of the church decided that Rome, um, Constantinople, Antioch, Alexandria, and honorary Jerusalem were the sees, the patriarchies, the centers of the Christian faith. You will notice that four of those are no longer Christian. Right? Rome is the only one of the original sees that is, that is in a Christianized part of the world. Jerusalem is a mixed, you know, mixed bag. It's not just Jewish or Christian there as well, but it was never a full sea, full patriarchy. Um, Constantinople, Antioch, and Alexandria are all now in Muslim countries. Um, very different history. We'll get to that. Well, uh, Constantinople is, is now Istanbul, isn't it? Yeah. Right. And it's in Turkey, and Turkey is 98% Muslim. It is a, it's a secular Muslim state, which means it's not rigid, it's not like Iraq or Iran or whatever. I mean, it's very open society, very progressive. Turkey is one of the most successful countries in the world right now. But it's still 98% Muslim. Not a lot of churches, okay? Uh, how did popes come to be? How is it that particularly the Pope of Rome took precedence? I'm going to spend 10 minutes and give you the history of everything you need to know about popes. <laughs> um, in 452, so we're talking only a little over 100 years after the Council of Nicaea. You know, we're talking 5th century. In 452, Attila the Hun, who had been called the Scourge of God, invades from the steppes in Asia, Russia, Asia, and across into Europe. The ultimate goal for anybody who made their living by sacking cities was Rome, the eternal city, the capital of the empire of Rome, okay, the most important city that ever had been. And many thought that never would be. Well, Attila, in 452, presents himself to the gates of Rome. And he is a, this astonishing army. Attila, by the way, is um, one of the great conquerors of all history. He went a long way and conquered everywhere he went. He shows up at the gate, 
and a, and a delegation comes out to meet him outside Rome at the Po River. And Attila agrees to meet with this embassy that's come out of Rome to negotiate with him. And that's common. You know, when a major army showed up outside a city, the first thing you did wasn't try to fight him, it was to try to negotiate with him. Well, included in that negotiation who represented the Roman emperor who was in Rome um, was Bishop Leo, the Bishop of Rome, the Patriarch of the See of Rome. Okay, one of the major leaders of the church. Leo was a very savvy guy. You would have thought that here Attila, the great conqueror, with his armies right outside the gates, and this bishop comes out to plead with him, don't hurt us. But it's, and, and what, what advantage did Leo possibly have against this army that's right outside the gates? And yet, Leo negotiates an agreement with Attila that he will not sack Rome, and that in fact, that he will turn him home. And Attila does it. Now, later on we find out that Attila wasn't telling anybody, but his army had suffered horribly from epidemics and famine. They didn't have enough to eat. And so the idea of an extended siege probably wasn't in his game plan either at that point. But the point was that Leo, the bishop of Rome, negotiates with him, and he agrees to do what Leo asks him to do. And so Leo comes back into Rome as the hero. He has turned away the scourge of God, which is what they called Attila. And so his stock went up significantly. They started referring to him as the vicar of Christ because he had shown his power in negotiating with Attila the Hun. Um, at that point, Leo is center stage for trying to establish the primacy of the Bishop of Rome over all the other patriarchies that existed. Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, which he begins to do. Based upon the fact that Peter, and they use scriptural arguments for this, that Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter, the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. And then, according to Catholic tradition, Peter, we do believe that Peter and Paul were both um, martyred in Rome, but that the tradition of the Catholic Church is that before he was martyred in Rome, Peter was the bishop of Rome, and therefore, Jesus gave Peter authority over the whole church, that he would be the rock on which the church was built, and so therefore everyone who inherited the position of bishop after Peter, likewise, they decided, should have that same authority as being the primary leaders of the whole of Christendom, the whole of the Christian church. Now, this was not officially declared until the First Vatican Council, which was in 1870. All right? That's a long time later. That's 1,400 years after Leo. But Leo started the process, and then the First Vatican Council declared that officially that Jesus had established the papacy of Rome with the Apostle Peter, and as the Bishop of Rome, every successor to Peter as the Bishop of Rome was the absolute supreme authority, the, 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 had primacy over the entire Christ, the Christian church. The word pope itself didn't wasn't just one person forever. The word pope is a variant on papa. In fact, a familiar that they use for the pope today. Catholics will refer to him as papa. All bishops were called papa at one point to indicate the fact that they were like the father figures for those who were under their care in the church. Eventually, in the 6th century, 700s, in the 6th century, they started, I'm sorry, 500s, they started using that almost exclusively for the bishop of Rome. But Leo, who had driven off the scourge of God by negotiating, not by force, they not only could claim that Peter was the first bishop of Rome, and therefore they could claim primacy based upon scripture, but they were in the imperial capital, the eternal city, the place that had started it all. Because even though Rome was in the decline, the city of Rome was in the decline, it was still where the Roman Empire started, and the Roman Empire was Christianity at that point. So they could say, we are the seat of everything that Christianity is, including where, where Peter started. So that, and, and I've talked before about size making a difference. Well, by the middle of the third century, so we're looking at the 200s here, by the middle of the third century, the church in Rome, this was when persecution still happened, and it happened more in Rome than anywhere. The church in Rome, by the middle of the third century, probably was close to 30,000 people. 
30,000 Christians in that city. They had 150 clerics and 1,500 women and orphans that were cared for by the church and worked in the church. It was a going concern, and size like that meant influence. So all of these bits and pieces come along. What scripture said about Peter, Peter is the bishop, Leo um, saving the city from Attila, the simple size of the church, the fact that it was the eternal city, the foundation for the Roman Empire, all of that went together to encourage all of Christendom to look to Rome as being the foremost location of Christendom. And then the councils we talked about, several of them identified Rome as being not only one of the seas, but first and foremost. It wasn't until the first council of Constantinople that Constantinople was declared to be equal with Rome, and all the others sort of fell underneath them. Okay. Um, it's also true when we talk about the importance of Peter, the pastors, or especially bishops, of cities where the churches were founded by apostles were always considered more important. And if Peter started, Peter, the first of the apostles, okay, if he's the one that started the church in Rome, then that's all the more reason why that should be held up as most significant. Now the problem we run into um, is Constantine comes along and he moves his capital to the east, to the east, to the new Rome. They call Constantinople the new Rome. And during this whole period of time that Rome is in decline and being threatened by barbarians, Constantinople is on the increase. But in a weird kind of way, that worked against Constantinople and in favor of Rome being foremost because the more Constantinople grew in terms of importance as the imperial capital and as a patriarchy, the more likely it was that the emperor was going to interfere and the less spiritual it was perceived. Whereas Rome, as the political power of Rome went down, the religious power of the bishop of Rome grew. And, the, and that's where the vicar of Christ sort of thing came up. People started looking to the pope, Pope Bishop Leo, who had got saved them from Attila the Hun, they started looking to him as the primary authority. And you start, we'll talk about that in future weeks, you start this long history of competition between the emperor or the person in political charge and the popes because of the growth of importance in Leo and the other popes in, uh, in Rome. Now, um, I think that's probably um, all I need to say in terms of the growth of the Roman papacy. Um, at various times, various emperors, for instance, Emperor Valentinian III, declared the primacy of the apostolic see because of Peter. And so you get these various other statements coming along about how important Rome and the Bishop of Rome are, even though Constantinople gets declared as being equal. Later on, after the Attila the Hun thing, we're looking quite a bit down the road in 455, the Vandals. You wonder what a Vandal is? Okay. There actually was a tribe of barbarian people called the Vandals, if you didn't know that. It didn't just mean they were spray painting slogans, slogans on the side of the <laughs> uh, Yeah, that too. The Vandals show up at the gate, and they, at, at the gate, and they have a king named Gaiseric, this is in March of 455. They have, you know, plundered through Europe. And Leo goes out to meet him. All right? The same Leo that had saved them from Attila the Hun. He goes out, and uh, Gaiseric was known as a great strategic thinker, uh, really successful, leading the Vandals. The Pope, uh, Leo, begs him, Bishop Leo begs him not to plunder the city, to restrain his troops, they were afraid he was going to burn the city because that's what he did. He burned the cities after he plundered them. And um, Leo offered money, you know, we will pay you. Don't burn down the city. Don't, you know, plunge. Well, Gaiseric listened to all this, nodded, turned his horse, and as he rode away, he said 14 days, he called back over his shoulder to Leo, 14 days of plunder. They opened the gates rather than have them torn down. The vandals came in. They plundered Rome. But they didn't burn it for two weeks. They plundered. And then they loaded everything back up. They'd actually come by boat, okay, as they, they had ships, sort of long ships that had landed there. They didn't burn the city. They didn't massacre the people. And they mostly left the Christian churches alone. So even though the city got plundered by the vandals, Leo still was a hero because he had saved the city of Rome for a second time. And they could clean up and they could, you know, they could rebuild the the some of the buildings had been damaged, but mostly they just took the stuff out of them. They took some slaves, but mostly everything was saved. And so Leo, for a second time, 
had saved the city from these barbarian hordes that nobody else could do anything about. It was at that point, the second time, that Leo declared for himself a title that had been a heathen and pagan title, uh, Pontifex Maximus, the Great Bridge, literally. All right. um, and so he declared that title, which had been a pagan worship title, and so the Pontiff, Pontifex, Pontiff, the Pontiff, the Pope of Rome, from Leo's point on, claiming scripture, claiming history, claiming that they were the seat of the Roman Empire anyway, grew and grew and grew. And, remember what I said earlier, the other great seas, the other great patriarchies, Constantinople, <coughs> Muslim, Antioch, in Syria, Muslim, Alexandria, in Egypt. There is a Coptic Christian presence in Egypt, but it is, has a very strong Muslim presence as well, so there's not really a center of you know, Christian scholarship and things like it was. There, eventually, Leo or his, his successor didn't have to claim primacy because the others didn't exist anymore. And so, de facto, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, became the authority in, in Christendom. Mm -hmm. Questions about that, John? Um, what was what was Caesar called? I mean, there was a, there was he was called something similar to that, wasn't it? A pope? Uh, uh, you call you call Leo a Pontifex Maximus. Yes. And, well, the the Caesar the the emperor was the head of the pagan religions. Yeah, but, but he he had a name that was a title that was similar to that. It I may have been that. I, I want to say it was the same thing. That's what they call the Caesar. Yeah, I, I, it's very possible. It seems to me like you may be right. But again, that's because the Caesar, the, the emperor, was considered the head priest, if you will, exactly. of all of the pagan religions. Exactly. And yet Leo claimed that title for the Bishop of Rome. Huh. Questions? Joanne. Well, um, you said he became you know, the Pope of the Church, and the others turned to Muslim. What, what was the rift that made him turn to Muslim? It wasn't a rift, it was a conquering of the Ottoman armies. Oh, okay. But Islam took over by force. Oh. You know, today, you know, it's all, it's very popular to criticize Christianity and say, for instance, when we get the Crusades, I'm going to tell you some things you probably would not have thought. The Crusades were in, they started as a as a war of defense. Doesn't mean everything that was done in the Crusades was right. But the reason is because the armies of Islam had conquered all of northern Africa. And next week I'm going to pick up with Augustine, which I meant to do today, who was the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa. Carthage was a major center. Alexandria was a major center. They're all North Africa. The Muslims conquered by force of arms, by the sword, and converted by force all of North Africa. They, they took over all of the Middle East. They took over from Saudi Arabia north. Syria, which had been a center, that's where Antioch is, that was one of the seas of the church. They took over all of Asia Minor, eventually, uh, and conquered uh, Constantinople, later turned it into Istanbul. And so they were threatening Eastern Europe, Christendom. They'd already taken over uh, a third or more of, Christian, of the Christian world. They actually conquered pretty much all of Spain and Portugal and were into southern France before the emperor in Constantinople cried out to the Bishop of Rome, the only center of Christianity, major center left, and said, help. And the Pope Innocent said, we have to do something about this. Deus vult, which means God wills it. And so they started fighting back. And that's where the Crusades started. Again, horrible things happened on both sides in the Crusades, but the motivation for doing it in the first place, I think, was right. They saw the armies of Islam destroying Christian Europe, or potentially destroying Christian Europe, and so they decided we have to fight back. So, yeah, it wasn't that they just decided to convert, it's that they were conquered and forced to convert. Very important difference. Okay. And it, I mean, we, we went to the trip that we took last year, we visited six of the seven churches that are mentioned in Revelation, you know, major churches in, in Christendom. The churches don't exist anymore. There's only ruins. The seventh place we didn't visit because there's not even ruins. And there is no church there anymore. And Asia Minor was a major center for Christianity. Ephesus, no less. You know, um, so we'll talk about that as we go along. Anything else?